When Father Zeus gave animals their weapons, speed and cunning to horse and fox respectively, he left nothing for us humans. So, without fur or natural weapons, our race was slowly dying. Until, of course, a titan, Prometheus, stole fire from the gods and brought it down to earth. Zeus, in rage, tied Prometheus to a rock on the Caucasus where two eagles tore his immortal flesh by day, letting it heal by night so they can begin again for an eternity. That is the myth recounted by ancient Greeks on how humans came to be. Because humans occupy this very strange place in the hierarchy of beings where we are half animal for certain, but we are half something else. And perhaps the Greeks were closest to understanding what this else is. The Greeks save from Nietzsche, of course, but in between you have the myth of Prometheus as a very powerful symbol that's re-emerging in the political sphere, especially on the right. And in this show, called On Tyranny, dedicated to exploring exactly what has been happening to our culture as of the latest measures taken worldwide to combat a disease of mismanagement more than a health issue. On Tyranny is an offshoot of Ancient Greece Revisited. You can find us on YouTube where we create short documentaries on ancient Greece, try to recapture the spirit of that ancient culture and use it in our troubled times. So faithful to our goal and to the myth I just recounted, I brought a writer who goes by the pseudonym of Romain d'Apremont, who wrote the book The Promethean Right, Why the Right is Losing the Battle of Ideas. I think the title alone um, gives us something to start with, just dismantling, uh, deconstructing every word on it. So, the Promethean, right? So, what is the, what? What does the myth of Prometheus, a uh, small part which I just recounted, what does it mean to you? When did you come to notice, read it, uh, absorb it in your being? What does it mean to you? Oh, actually, I will be very honest about this myth. Um, it's really the, um, what motivated me in, um, in using this word is the fact that um, it's um, a myth um, at the basis of uh, the West, of our Greek and uh, our Greek roots. And uh, I'm very opposed to Christianity, so I prefer to favor such type of myth uh, instead of uh, uh, Jesus, for instance. Uh, but what I mean by Promethean, Promethean is, is to be rebelliously creative, is to uh, tell the right to uh, not to be anti-technology anymore and to embrace this will to change human nature and to uh, steal the monopoly of human nature, of shaping human nature and stealing it not to the gods. <laughs> they don't exist. I'm not a pagan, not a Christian. I'm an agnostic. I won't say I'm an atheist because it's another type of uh, faith. Uh, but to steal it to the new god, the left, the left which has the monopoly of the future. So yeah, if we don't steal this, uh, the flame of uh, of um, a technology of uh, genetic engineering, well, we will keep losing, you know. Uh, and it's what uh, made me write the book. Um, by the way, I'm French and my book is partly a translation of my first book in French and uh, it has been extensively edited by, uh, by English natives, of course. Um, you can cut me whenever you want, but uh, I will go on. Did you ever wonder why the right is losing the battle of ideas? Well, I, I would uh, like to wander it uh, together uh, here with you. Um, but perhaps b before sure. we go, it's interesting how you declared, you know, your belief, because I'm kind of caught in the middle because of this show, because I'm Greek. So part of my heritage is definitely Christian. And another part is definitely uh, non-Christian pagan. Um, and these two have historically come into conflict. But on the other hand, an, another empire was built, the Byz Byzantine Empire, which, again, people, some people like that, some people don't, but it's actually closer to modern Greeks. But I'm kind of caught in the middle, and because I interview people who are both very Christian, 
pagans and non um i i i get uh interesting mail um i am trying to rediscover the roots of greece and perhaps uh Roma, the roots of the west and we have both there so we sometimes have to uh m not marry the two not find a middle ground i don't like these lukewarm ideas but accept the fact we are children of these two great traditions but moving on to the very interesting tangent that you are open the right politically is losing the battle of ideas that's the second part of the title certainly it is i can confirm that why is that yeah why um i would say because there is a perpetual process of leftization you know in the long term and when i say long term i don't only refer to the french revolution where the concepts of right and left were born but of the advent of one of the first left-wing uh, ideology uh, christianity well it's this question I try to answer and try to give to the right the recipe for victory. Um, back in 2015, 2016, I diagnosed the rise of uh, right-wing populism as a conjectural phenomenon. Uh, some of us were, cry, uh, were shouting, well, victory. No, not victory. Very conjunctural victory. Uh, we may still have some... What do you mean by conjunctural, by the way, just just, just to clarify that term? Uh, conject, uh, conjunctural, ah, yeah, it's, uh, maybe it's in French. Uh, very uh, temporary victory. Uh, yeah. Temporary victory, yes. And we may still have some far-right parties win some elections, but the tide of history, the tide of history, will ultimately be the same, leftization. Uh, the main reason why the left is so victorious comes from its monopoly on the new man, as the right has proved unable to propose a new anthropological horizon. Except, of course, in the fascist experiments, the right has always despised the concepts of a new man and a new society. Therefore, the, the monopoly uh, on the future has been handed over to the left. I think the right has... Um, has been losing because it is conservative and not revolutionary. I believe that only through the affirmation of a new progressivism can the right reverse the, the trend of leftization. It must make a kind of um, Copernican revolution. Uh, actually, take up a vessel, a vessel wrongly assumed to be left-wing. This vessel is um, the project of a new man. And fill this vessel with right-wing contents like uh, elitism, uh, lust for struggle, and self-overcoming. Actually, I, I don't want a return to fascism. Fascism is only one of the many possible variants of the Promethean right. But I think that without an awakening of this political family, the West will not survive. The electoral victories of uh, you know, Trump-style populists are welcome, of course, but they are only cyclical and superficial reactions. They fail to wage the one battle that matters, the battle for the evolution of human nature. And the right is doomed to fail unless it becomes revolutionary in a Promethean sense, uh, willing to shape the future, to do social engineering, to be... A, you, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I think I understand. Just to qualify these things, um, you know, just clarify my position as well in all these things. Uh, you know, me, I have a very typical story. Um, there's a joke uh, in England, I've heard it, uh, that said, if you are not on the left when you are young, you have no heart. If you are not on the right when you are old, you have no brains. Yeah. And me being somewhere between young and old, I am, I've been feeling that shift since, I guess, 2015, I noticed, um, because I did belong to a left to a, a, a left-wing party um, back in 2010, although it was a patriotic left-wing party. Uh, for those um, Greek listeners, you might know the name of Dimitris Kazakis is, is the name, a man who I still admire, hopefully kind of going to bring him to the show. He was this kind of patriotic uh, communist um, that is often being called a far-right um, fascist by these kind of more degenerate leftists that perhaps Roman you were talking about but my orientation was definitely towards you know uh, p 
patriotism, self-sacrifice, serving a greater goal. That has been my spiritual orientation since day one. And trying to find a home when I was very young, the home that was offered to me was the left because it had all these great ideals of you know self-sacrifice in the name of humanity uh fight against oppression oppression of minorities oppression of women oppression of uh, genders of, of, and um, as i grew up i realized my mistake because i saw i saw this degeneracy around me that had a leftist guise and just to stand on this, just to, because with you, Roma, I want to super clarify every single word, which is what I'm all about as well, not throw things around for the converted. Let's talk about the left, to qualify it. And I talked about this patriotic variant that, you know, I felt an affinity towards. Um, is what we're witnessing the left, or is it a hollowed out left? Is it that the left was very marketable so it got hijacked it got abducted by some very powerful centers and some some very powerful people we know that um, organizations such as black lives matter are funded ultimately by george soros that, that's no conspiracy i mean the data is there um and that's just one example it, it's kind of like if you were to tell me when i was 20 um, that uh, a multi-billionaire would fund a social justice movement up, up would think you're insane. But it does. There's this. Is it something in the left in, endemic or has the left been hijacked, you think, by these powerful people? Uh, sure, I will answer this. But before, yeah, um, there is kind of a balance. Sometimes we hear that the left is the heart and uh, the right is the brain. Uh, I think is also giving uh, the monopoly of the art to the left and the monopoly of a kind of uh, morality. And it weakens the right. Uh, we need to shape our own morality, which is not a Christian morality, because we are fighting within um, um, uh, a Christian software uh, where the left has a lot of advantage because, of course, it's um, an outgrowth of Christian Christianity. Uh, what we are you are referring to this guy uh, being a communist and a patriot? Yeah, it's um, a type of collectivist right. Uh, I'm not really into this collectivist right. I'm between this uh, individualistic right and collectivist right. So kind of moderate to this um, point of view. Uh, now, has the left been hijacked and? How do I define the left? I don't think I don't think it has been hijacked. Uh, more, it's it, there is a, an eternal an internal logic in, inside uh, within the left, uh, which is more and more egalitarian, uh, uh, moved by resentment, self hatred. So, I would define the left and the right as two eternal concepts, two opposed systems of values. Uh, the right, not only historical, but I would say uh, within life itself, you know, two drives, opposed drives. Um, the right can be defined as a system valuing struggle, competition, uh, selection, hierarchy, and self-overcoming. And the left can be defined as the system valuing egalitarianism, weakness, love of enemies, and relativism. And th th there is no limit to this. Uh, the left, there is always something to... Uh, make it more equal, uh, more weak. Uh, the left can be associated with a, a death principle and the right, I will associate it with a life principle. I would say that the party of death corresponds to all the social forces working, working for the advent of egalitarianism, relativism and love of enemies. And the party of life uh, corresponds to all the social forces aiming to self-overcoming elitism beauty. Now, uh, why the death principle is so power powerful in the West? Why the left is so powerful? Because one particular attribute of the life principle, and I'm talking here about the will to progress, the will to progress is a principle of uh, the right normally, uh, came to be wrongly identified with the death principle, which means the left. Uh, I mean, when we hear the word progress, we think about the left. And this is a major weakness for the right. I consider that progress, the adventurous spirit, imagination, um, risk-taking, originality, uh, thirst for novelty, you know, are all right-wing attributes and I would say Promethean attributes.
Mm, yeah, I can I can identify with that because I have clear memories when I was growing up in Greece. Uh, at some point, I must have been 14 or 15. I just realized that all the artists uh, I knew were leftists. And I, I just I remember I asked someone could have been my, my, my father. I said, why are all artists yeah. leftists? And, and I had this answer that, you know, um, artists, they're very freedom loving. So the left is very freedom loving. And so they naturally. Um, but you are right. Um, I did associate the left with uh, freedom, um, progress, freedom. These were words that associated on the on the left. And what I've been witnessing now is that we are through this leftist, um, dare I say, subversion of the West, um, we've been led into a kind of tyranny, uh, which I guess this show is about to explore. Um, like people know that I've been very opposed to uh, the lockdown measures, uh, to mask wearing, um, to mandatory vaccinations. I've been told not to even mention these words because channels get demonetized, but I won't play the stupid game of pantomime that a lot of journalists understandably play. And instead of saying vaccine, they just point to their arm and say, you know, this medical procedure, that's all BS. I mean, it is what it is. So, and I have noticed that uh, it was very difficult to predict who would be for and who would be against. In other words, people could be very intelligent and they could be very for or very against. Uh, they could be very educated, they could be very for, they could be very against, well-traveled. I could, it, until I realized that the political lines of the left and the right match almost perfectly to people being you know, pro lockdowns, pro vaccinations, and people being against. And you see it on channels. Um, online, you see something like Rebel News, you know, um, that's been pro Trump, uh, which I personally am not necessarily, but that new channel was pro Trump. And then, of course, it was anti lockdowns and, and various other figures. And um, so it's almost like the leftists like this control, top-down control, more than the right. And that's not what we were taught at school. We were taught, my generation, I guess your generation, we were taught that the right is the, the, the party of, you know, control and dominance and order. But I see much more control and forced control coming from the left, right? What, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I agree. It's uh, the divide in France is less uh, neat. Uh, many right wing people are also uh, for the lockdown, but by and large, you're right. Uh, the left is more uh, pro lockdown, and the uh, and the left uh, the left more pro lockdown than the right than the right. Okay, uh, you have analyzed this very well, but I would say also that. According to me, the left is pro-lockdown because um, left-wing people are more fragile, uh, more weak, I would say, and uh, more fearful. Um, and they can't be fearful about immigrants because it's not, um, it does not fit their religion of love of enemies. Uh, but they at, le at last that they can hate someone else, something else than the right uh, white wing people. They can hate the virus. And so now they have some kind of, um, um, I, I would say, um, a can, they, yeah, they canalize, uh, I would say, uh, I, I don't find the word, but they, they, yeah, now they can be anti uh, something uh, which is uh, threatening uh, mankind, you know, and maybe uniting uh, mankind against uh, this uh, virus, uh, just like the, the dead or walking dead um, in Game of Thrones. The, also, they know that they control the institutions. I mean, even when Trump was in control, in power he was not in control he was in power as a president but he was not in control of the institutions so the left uh, is less less anti lockdown because they know they they have power actually mm -hmm. what happened historically to the right that lost its power it was it the historical defeat of let's say the axis powers that put a 
stain on anything right wing or is there something more? Uh, yeah, th there is a historical and uh, immediate um, reason is uh, World War II, of course. Uh, the, the, it has been the last and the, the only actually attempt of the right to be utopian, to be um, collectivist in a sense, and to be revolutionary, uh, Promethean in a sense. Uh, of course, uh, in Germany, they went uh, a bit too far. Uh, in Italy, it was quite a right. Uh, so the right has been shameful and uh, lost uh, its uh, power. Um, it's, um, yeah. And also because there has been, of course, a, v a much more um, ancient defeat, historical defeat with the takeover of Christianity uh, within the Roman Empire. Uh, we are playing in, uh, within um, rules of the game, which are uh, left wing, and our morality is, the, is left wing too. So uh, th the right can, can only lose. Um, also, some people would say there are lobbies, like, uh, you know, Jewish lobbies, and uh, yeah, but why, and uh, immigrationist lobbies, of course, but why those lobbies can have so much power and influence um, to destroy yeah. the West? Because they, 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 they are playing within uh, a software which is Christian, with self-hatred, love of enemies, already uh, put so this, those same lobbies in China or in Japan, they won't have any uh, margin, you know, of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I just need to ask because I know that um, some of my viewers are, are devout Christians and I can almost hear their, their, their yeah, screams at you, where you, you say that the left is Christian in its very core and they would say that no, the left is worshipping false gods, so to speak. They're worshipping the state, they're worshipping power, and their vision is not a transcendent vision. It's a vision of this world here. What do you say to that? I would say that I love those Christ Christians, but I don't consider them um, original Christians. When I say Christianity, I mean uh, the original message um, of uh, Christianity, of Jesus, and also uh, maybe slightly changed by St. Paul. Uh, love of enemies, uh, equality, uh, love of the poor, uh, love of the meek, the, the doors of the paradise will be open to them. This inversion of, uh, of the order and of the hierarchy. Um, Christians today being nationalists, patriots, of course they are, but they are no more Christians. For me, the real Christian will be, you know, this left-wing guy uh, whose wife has been murdered uh, at the Bataclan during the jihadist attacks, and he said, to the jihadist, he wrote a book actually, he said, um, you won't have my hate. Yeah, nothing is more Christian than this. So he does not believe in Jesus, but actually he embodies much more Jesus than uh, those um, Christians uh, wanting war and uh, civil war and defending their, yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, what we mean. Yeah, I can understand that. And I think it's worth mentioning that what happened with Christianity was, was indeed this strange inversion um, of uh, ideals that happened as the ancient world was receding. Um, just You can just take it by images, you know, Homer, for example, would have these comparisons between warriors and lions, you know, Achilles would rush to battle like a lion uh, after and he would, Homer would get into great detail on exactly what type of lion, you know, the, the, the hungry lion coming from the steps as he's gazing on a, on a poor fawn. And I, so did Achilles jump on his enemies, and there would be these great symbols. And then the metaphor in Christianity is the lamb, which is the victim of the lion. So the victim becomes the the protagonist, uh, the holy animal, so to speak, of a new poetry. This is not as poetic, but still very powerful. So I think you are right. There was this inversion. Um, but somehow this inversion did not lead to a society that was necessarily weak. It led to still uh, the continuation, like I said, in my parts of the world, the Roman Empire morphing into Byzantium and becoming uh, strong. And there were concerns by philosophers. Um, uh, Zosimos was, was one such, uh, I think, pagan philosopher in, in the very early uh, late Rome, actual Rome, early Byzantium, who thought that Christianity would make 
uh, the Romans uh, weak, but it didn't. It uh, the Rome, new Rome, Byzantine Rome stood for another thousand years. So what what do you say to that? Could could we be just witnessing a watered down Christianity, and could the actual Christianity be much more muscular? You think? Yeah, I understand. Of course, I'm 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 pretty much for the Christianity of the Crusades. Uh, I would say that um, the the Christian civilization was not weak because it was not everything. Uh, the Christian the Church wanted to um, a bit domesticate the violence and uh, to bring. In a warlike society, like the Roman society or medieval society, to bring a bit of Christianity, of peace, you know, uh, domestication of the pulsions and also sublimation. It can lead to the sublimation of the pulsions, of the warlike drive to create a civilization, cathedrals, music, etc. Um, this is very sane. But if you still have this Christian morality within a very pacifist society, like Europe, then you have uh, pacifism squared. Mm. You know, uh, you have pacifism at the outside, pacifism within the society, and uh, ultimately you have invasion. Um, if I made myself clear. Yes, no, no, I, th I think you have. And again, just to make words ultra clear, you didn't mention a very dangerous word before, that was fascism. Um, I know that in your book uh, you said something very bold. You said that um, still people on the right, if I can quote you directly, um, correct me if I'm wrong, people on the right, you said, uh, still do not call fascism for what it was, the only right-wing movement with a positive vision for the future, or something to that effect. Um, what is your relationship with this very dangerous uh, ideology, which is fascism. Actually, fascism for me is only uh, an avatar of the Promethean right. It's a very historically dated um, avatar, um, very fit for its own period, which is the interwar period. It's very efficient to prepare for the world of that time, which is a, war, a world of war. Uh, and of course, we saw that Germany, even if it was uh, largely outnumbered, even industrially uh, outnumbered, uh, because USSR produced just even more than uh, Germany, and uh, we forgot that uh, the UK, with uh, its empire, produced uh, industrially equally, just like Germany. But the German warrior was so great also because of, uh, of this fascist uh, mindset. Uh, so... Today, we don't need first a totalitarian state uh, because we need much more um, uh, network-centric uh, led uh, creativity and innovation. And second, we don't need a society built for war. Why? Because first, the land, the, con the conquest of the land is no more important. What is important is intelligence. Uh, second, the real conquest of the land won't be uh, in our Earth, in our planet, but it will be uh, the gal a galactic uh, expansion. And and third, I would say that there is a nuclear uh, uh, deterrence, you know, so we, we can't, uh, if if we become a fascist society, warlike society, well, we, ju we, we will only an annihilate ourselves. It's, it's outdated, you know, but what is not outdated is the Promethean right. And uh, our today's, um, avatar of this uh, Promethean right would be a right-wing a, a right-wing uh, transhumanism. Yeah, and, and just just to add something to that, um, what I find terrifying, because you were talking about the, the, the new man and, and Nietzsche, we can talk about Nietzsche as well, but um, what I find terrifying is the fact that it seems that we have arrived at the capacity to engineer a new human, more or less, Perhaps some people are exaggerating. Perhaps Elon Musk is exa exaggerating when he says, talks about uh, artificial intelligence. Perhaps not. I I'm not going to go, go in, in that. But we are moving towards a future where we will be able to engineer a new human just at the time when we have no idea what that human should be. So we have been given this 
Promethean fire just when we do not know what to do with it because we have no standards. If the ancient Greeks, that's part of my work, if the ancient Greeks were given this technology somehow, like time travel or just sheer chance, they were given this gene editing, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, all these things combined, this singularity kind of technology. If the ancient Greeks were given, we kind of know what they would have engineered. They would have engineered Apollo, you know, man, what would be that incarnation, the body in its perfection. They would inscribe, you know, uh, the Fibonacci sequence in uh, the the genome and the, the bone and muscle structure of that creature. And they would make him very beautiful um, with a very specific Greek type of beauty and uh, very strong, very intelligent, very philosophical, um, very patriotic. Uh, kind of what you hear in Plato's Republic, which is a social engineering project minus the technology. Um, Although it's very interesting that Plato alludes to something like the Matrix, which I'm definitely going to be doing an episode on that, when Socrates says that the only way for uh, the plans that I just laid out, Socrates talks about the perfect state, and he describes that perfect state, which is a very hierarchical, caste-like structure. Um, the only way he says that th this will come into being is that if we tell people a lie, a noble lie was the word, and uh, that lie would be that everything they had dreamed, so they would go into a society trying to install this new society uh, with this new man, and they would tell them that everything they had experienced up until this moment was a dream. And in fact, they grew under the earth like roots, where God had implanted their memories of what they thought was true life. So it's a myth that Plato creates to show how difficult it is to move towards a new vision uh, without having the baggage of the old. Plato said that, you know, we're just going to tell people that everything they had been living up until that moment was a dream. They were living in the matrix, so to speak, and now we're unplugging them. Um, so that vision, the Greeks had a vision. I'm not saying that all Greeks were Plato, but the Greeks had a vision. Today we have this technology and we don't even know uh, right from wrong, beautiful from ugly. So you come in and you suggest a new direction. Am I right? Yeah, actually, I don't define it uh, very much. Actually, uh, it will be the project of a new book. First, I have to uh, to to kill this conservatism of the right. Um, I would say that um, it's it's very first. It's very hard to define it. Even Nietzsche could not define his new man. And uh, because we, how can we define it? Uh, because we are not it already. Uh, what we can do is first improve uh, man in the same uh, direction. I mean, not trying to alter the species too much, to create some new species. It, it will come, uh, we will become a new species very incrementally, and we will also have to beware of, of hybris. It's very, a very, very dangerous path. It's a very dangerous path because it is in, incremental and uh, and na human nature has changed. It changed every, uh, always, always changing. Of course, genetically and culturally, because we are changed both by memes and by uh, genetic uh, evolution. Um, now, what we know is that the left uh, knows what its new man would look like. It would be shaped uh, by anti-racism, uh, so racially mixed, uh, no sexes, uh, according to gender theory. The genes of loyalty to the group will be erased. Uh, the gene of authority, of hierarchy, of aggressiveness, of competition will all be erased. Uh, now, I know that in the right, some um, transhumanists would like a much more uh, how do you say, rational man. I don't think we should be overly rational uh, ra rational yeah i think we would still need some unconscious some inner conflict uh creating some dynamism i don't want that we should become transparent to ourselves 
our unconscious, our demons within, demons in Greek, within should still live. Um, we still don't know consciousness. Uh, maybe we are made of ver various personalities, and if we alter this too much, we would unleash hell maybe on Earth. Uh, so it, it should be a very incremental process and um, hand in hand with the understanding of, understanding of consciousness. And by the way, I'm not a materialist, I am an, an idealist. Uh, I believe that everything is consciousness, that it is uh, much more, um, um, not, not economical, but uh, parsimonious. And I've been convinced by a great philosopher, um, uh, his name is Bernardo Castrup, He's very rational, uh, he's a great mind, a scientific mind, walking at CERN, you know, the Large Hadron Collider, and he's also uh, an idealist philosopher. Yeah, I've uh, read some, some of his works and I could not really understand where he was going with this, but I, I know that one thing that he was saying is that all, all phenomena are mental phenomena. So, um, yeah. you know, I can look outside my window and I see a tree and I see a building. Um, these are um almost like parts of a larger mind if i understand him correctly yeah you should watch his videos is very uh, actually i would sum up very shortly um mm -hmm. what you see the the rocks the planets the universe is what universal consciousness looks like just like when you look at your brain and your body the body of the another person this body and this brain is what his consciousness looks like from mm. across a dissociative boundary. What this means is that global consciousness is split, dissociated, uh, just like in people suffering from dissociative personality disorder. And it's, we, yeah, so uh, matter is just what consciousness looks like, and it solves almost all the problems of quantum physics and of course it solves the problem of the heart problem of consciousness how can we explain that consciousness emerges from matter no no one even in principle can explain how consciousness emerges from matter but now if you reverse it all if you say that matter emerges from consciousness it's very easy it's like in a dream yeah, I, I perhaps need to rewatch his. You mentioned two very interesting things, Nietzsche and materialism. And one thing that I like to say is that Nietzsche was not that traditionalist that some people on the right want to make him into. Nietzsche was someone, and that's something that's missed, I think, across the board. Um, there's a parallel I'm trying to make where I read a book about the biography of Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs, the biographer of Jobs said uh, what people don't understand about Jobs is that Jobs was half genius and half asshole. <laughs> people yeah. who try to imitate him get the asshole part perfect and that they struggle with the genius. And perhaps I've met a couple of these in my uh, work as a software engineer. Um, in startups, but what people don't understand about Nietzsche is that Nietzsche was half Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, however you want to call them, reduct kind of reductive materialist, and half Conan the Barbarian. People <laughs> who love him get the Conan part perfect, and then they struggle with 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 the Dawkins. Nietzsche was someone who had accepted the categories of modern science and materialism to a large degree and he tried to find a way upwards for the human spirit through that do, do you think i'm doing him justice yeah very much actually he was very much influenced by darwinism and uh, the idea of evolution uh, actually he did not understood uh, darwinism very well he confused it with um, i forgot the other guy um, the other scientist um, um yeah not this one uh, 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 um, a eugenist and social darwinist spengler maybe or spencer i forgot yeah maybe spencer or Sp spengler yeah maybe i forgot uh, anyway uh, yeah there is a contradiction within Nietzsche. actually uh it's uh this this concept of will to power um coming from of course schopenhauer um so Nietzsche wanted to solve the pessimism of schopenhauer and uh saying no nature is cruel of course it's 
it's cruel, but we have to love this cruelty because this cruelty is life itself and we, we have to love it. Okay, but this concept, Nietzschean concept of will to power, uh, has evolved. First, he applied this will to power only to man, and then he applied it to nature. And then at the very end, it applied it to all of reality. And then at this point, Nietzsche became an idealist, saying that all is will to power, even matter, even the atoms. But then Nietzsche entered into some contradiction, a contradiction between its immanence, reductionist at, uh, aspect, and transcendence and metaphysics, the very metaphysics he wanted to destroy. And this contradiction, unfortunately, died before solving it, you know. And how would you solve that contradiction? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I don't. Um, personally, yeah, actually, actually, I think that I, we, we have to go full, full, uh, um, fully into idealism because it cannot be solved if you try to be both materialist and um, and idealist, it would mean that you are dualist, and dualism does not hold. You have to go fully into uh, idealism, which is not anti-science. Uh, anti I mean, science does not tell you the nature of reality. It tells you how reality behaves and how do you the regularities of your perception of realities. But science is not... I mean, today's science, since the 19th century, is materialist. But uh, science can always work within uh, within idealist uh, framework, you know. And it will solve. And actually, I think that Nietzsche solved uh, his contradiction, but he did not want it to admit that at the end that all was matter explicit, uh, all was consciousness explicitly. So, um, in a sense, he solved it being. Um, uh, between the lines, you can see that he became an idealist, but he still not used. Um, he still used some materialist words, and uh, this the contradiction come from this. Well, I think he, at the end of his life, he wanted to study uh, what we would call thermodynamics, in a sense. So he was convinced that there was something in that study of uh, matter. Um, but he definitely comes at a time where the whole of humanity is moving towards that uh, materialism. And, and you said that you're not a Christian, you're not a pagan, but you are still, uh, you're not a materialist. So you have a very, yeah, perhaps Nietzschean view of, of things. And one thing that I was always wondering is that if you if one cannot design the superman so to speak because he is not the superman yet so he cannot even conceive of that superman how does one even begin it it, it almost comes as uh xenos paradox uh which was an ancient greek riddle where you know to travel from a to b you need to travel half the distance but to travel half the distance you need to travel half the distance of that and half of that and half and at some point you can't even start because even starting you need to travel half the distance of your first step it's a brain teaser rather than because we know we can just take a step and walk and travel but it's a brain teaser but in your our case here talking it's more than that it, how can we even begin moving towards the a direction that we consider worthy uh, without even knowing where we're going because we're not fit to even imagine that Superman, that Promethean man, that future man that you are advocating for. Yeah, I think that Zeno's paradox is an intellectual game but does not fit into reality. Of course, we are very good at abstracting reality and then forgetting that our abstraction are only descriptions and abstraction of reality. Uh, it's the same for consciousness, you know. Uh, we say, ah, maybe we will be able to simulate consciousness into a computer and poof, a new conscience will emerge. No, no. Uh, a sim the simulation and the abstraction is not the reality. Um, so there is a problem. It's, it's the same problem. It's a problem of continuity and categories. Um, at which point uh, the man became, uh, the monkey, the ape become, well, we are apes, but I mean, the monkey became a man. 
Uh, there is a continuity. At which point yellow becomes green? There is a continuity. But of course, if they are not the same. Green, if we create this concept of green or of mankind, uh, it won't be the same as yellow or as the Superman. It's a question of words, but there is also a reality within it, just like in the spectrum of color. Uh, now, this change is very real. It can be go, go upward or downward. And if we don't do anything, of course, diagenics will solve this problem in a, in a bad way because we, uh, this this last uh, 20,000 years we lost uh, or 10,000 years we lost the amount of a tennis ball uh, in our brain and uh, the projection for the next 30,000 years our brain will uh, come back to the state of uh, Homo erectus, which means 75% of our brain capacity. And, and what, what are the evolutionary forces there? Because it feels like we're using more of our brain daily. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's because um, when uh, natural selection played out, uh, the, the jumper's guide died without child. Uh, I mean, they were bitten by snakes. They couldn't uh, um, uh, hunt effectively so nature was very cruel uh, with the small scru small groups of humans uh, so the pressure was intense but with the state uh, the germs could be protected and with medicine the germs could have even more children and with uh, since the 18th century uh, smart people had a much lower fertility rate compared to germ people and so diagenics comes out. Well, one question that comes to mind is um, you advocate for the use of these technologies, uh, be it genetic engineering, neuroscience, virtual reality, augmented reality, you're advocating uh, for a new vision, towards a new vision uh, that holds, let's say for the sake of the argument, these, these right-wing values. Is there something, however, in technology itself that is almost like an autonomous agent. In other words, just like you said, you talked about the left having an internal logic that eventually, according to what you said, I might disagree slightly, but according to what you said, the left has an internal logic that will inevitably lead to third wave feminism, social justice, gender pronouns, etc. Is there an internal logic to technology, to science and modern science specifically, that will inevitably lead to an outcome that might not be your desired outcome? Is there a logic to technology itself? Is technology the ruler rather than the, the slave? Okay, very interesting question. Uh, I don't have an, uh, a clear answer to that. It's much too much more complex. I would say that technology can be seen as neutral. Uh, we can attempt to do things we can do. We can do them, don't do them. We can, of course, uh, in a type. It depends of, on the context. In times of war, of course, you will use your new weapon like uh, the atomic bomb. Uh, of course, you can create human chimeras, and uh, today we are creating them, but on, only at the state of embryos and to serve uh, mankind and medicine. But of course, we would be able to create, and according to liberalism, anyone could, uh, I don't know, engineer this for his child and uh, create uh, uh, whatever he wants. Um, okay, but I think that human nature still has very large aversion towards monster and what uh, uh, this type of uh, deformities. Uh, so I would say that um, the, the, the ultimate master of technology is still human nature, our own fears. We can use our atomic bombs. Uh, they want maybe to be used uh, abstractly like this, but human nature uh, is the ultimate master because we are so afraid of this. That uh, we, we I would say the the, the future uh, the future will be the interaction between human nature and technology. Technology is not the only master here. Uh, of course, we can al always say there is a, a, a fixed scenario for the future, like uh, AI will become conscious. I don't believe this, but maybe we can say we can believe it. Uh, AI will become conscious, and then it will be the new master. And of course, it will happen because if one country forbids this, forbids it, maybe China will do it. 
and it's all written. Um, the problem with all written things is usually they don't um, play out and we always have some surprises. I used to think that AR would become conscious, but it's only within the materialist framework that you consider this. As an idealist, I think it's bullshit. Uh, AR will be more and more intelligent, but not conscious. I don't say that a very intelligent AI is not a threat to mankind. Of course it is. And that's also why it's very dangerous to merge consciousness totally with this new AR god we would like to create within the singularity. Uh, we may lose more than our humanity. We may lose um, our consciousness because we will merge with something making us believe it is conscious, but it won't be conscious. It will mm. only be a simulation. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Me, I was thinking more about, you know, the roots of modern science. So, for instance, uh, and that's something I've been researching for a long time, that the, the difference between the ancient and modern mind. And one the difference there is that the, the, the ancient mind saw holes as, as dominant, while the modern mind sees parts as dominant. In other words, you know, if a child points to a cloud and asks, you know, his father what, what that is, if that father is scientifically minded or a scientist, will look at the cloud and say, it's just uh, a bunch of water molecules floating up in the air, right? So there's an ontology to modern science whereby the higher, the cloud, the formation is explained in terms of the lower. So the, the molecules are real, the cloud is just what they how they appear to us in in a certain state and of course then you can ask about what are molecules and then the father is going to say it's nothing but if it's water hydrogen and oxygen you know two atoms of hydrogen one atom of oxygen so not even molecules are real atoms are real and then you can break this down into protons and and it seems that whenever modern science goes a step lower, it considers that a success as if it found something more real. But that I believe, and that is part of my work here, is an idea, an idea that came part and parcel with a modern mind. And this idea, if you flip it over on the political realm, you see that when the lower defines the higher, then you end up with something like radical leftism, whereby uh, you know, the the basics of who we are is what's common rather than what's unique. You know, I might be Greek, you might be French, but ultimately we both go to the toilet, we both eat, sleep, so we're the same. This idea that we're the same because we have basic functions is a very modern idea, as if this lowest common denominator defines us more than our spiritual output or ideas etc etc it's very much ingrained in the modern mind that what's common is more real so me personally i see something in if modern science is an application or if technology modern technology is an application of modern science and modern science is a product of the modern mind then i see modern technology inevitably pushing towards egalitarianism what do you think about that? It's very interesting what you say that, that um, uh, okay, the, the yeah, um, I would say that um, it's, of course, we can say that only the whole exists. And um, every categories we build are constructions of our mind. And to some extent, it's the case. But if we go um, in, that, in this direction, we won't use any more words because words are constrictions. So we can't speak. And if we can't speak and categorize, we can't think. And if we can't think, let's just kill ourselves. We are useless. So it's a very nihilistic uh, ideology. It's, it's, it's like uh, Foucault, uh, this Derrida, uh, playing smart boys, smart, smart children, playing with words, and everything is constructs, constructions. Yeah, okay, okay. But it builds nothing. It only destroys. Um, of course, we are all within materialism. Of course, we are all atoms. But there are emergence 
we can uh, um, life is an emergence from uh, atoms from uh, the fundamental uh, reality and you say it's left wing yeah equalitarianism at the end is wanting to go back to rock bottom to mere atoms uh, and saying that we are all built it's like anti-speciesism it's the new next step uh, after anti-racism th there is anti-speciesism and i think the next step is anti uh, suppressing deleting erasing the, the the border between the living and the non-living we are all uh, and maybe it will merge with this new movement of panpsychism saying that uh, there is uh, consciousness even within atoms uh, it's a kind of dualism actually and yeah? panpsychism um, the next step like left wing panpsychism you can't uh, destroy this rock because it's as feeling to at the end mankind must kill itself because uh, because it will always destroy something and make it suffer mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there a Promethean movement in Europe right now? <laughs> yeah, there is four of us. <laughs> no, I mean, we are the fringe of the fringe of the fringe. Uh, I mean, uh, the far right is already a fringe. And within the far right, uh, there are um, uh, people being embracing technology. And within these people, maybe there are transhumanists. Now, how can you define Prometheism? It's a world that I think created by uh, George Ani, right? Mm, I wanted to ask you about that for sure, yes. Yeah, so uh, I don't say I'm part of the Prometheus movement because, you know, it's just a world I choose to, uh, to say that the right must embrace technology and uh, I could have called it uh, the transhumanist right. Um, it's very, very marginal in the West, very marginal. I don't think we will have power. I think it's useful to uh, state what we have to state. But if you ask me between my commonalities and difference with Georgiani, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Jason Georgiani is someone uh, I've been in contact with. He's been kind enough to re reply and uh, hopefully we'll bring him on the show. But uh, he has or claim this word Prometheanism almost, um, but obviously it, and everyone can use it. But he wants to turn it into a political project. So how, how does his vision compare to yours? How are they different? Have you been in contact? Are you going to join forces? Uh, yeah, I've been uh, slightly in contact, of course. I've uh, watched his videos, read his book, uh, Prometheism, uh, after I, I, I wrote my French book and translated uh, partly in, in, in English. Um, well, we both are right-wing and transhumanist, and uh, actually I'm very opposed to instilling dissent into our camp, but of course we have differences. Uh, I think we are far too weak to be divided. Uh, at the same time, everyone of us has to keep an open mind and accept the debate and the critics. Uh, so I will maybe focus on the, on the differences, uh, not really real critics actually. Uh, first, I'm more careful about conspiracy theories, uh, just like the breakaway civilization, Nazi technologies concerning time travel and free energy. Uh, Nazis having uh, infiltrated the US deep state, uh, which seems contradictory with my view of a multiculturalist deep state and a far, actually very far from Nazi ideals. And um, it seems all the more unlikely when you're aware of the low competence of German and Nazi intelligence and counterintelligence during World War II. Yeah, and just to qualify that for the listeners, uh, Giorgiani, who's a writer, a philosopher, I've followed, like I said, his, his works, uh, and he founded uh, what he wants to make it into a political project. Um, yeah, came out uh, lately, uh, talking about extraterrestrials who are not extraterrestrials necessarily, uh, talking about the UFO phenomena and how they might be, uh, like he said, a breakaway civilization, uh, which is a fascinating but very, very hard to believe concept, um, whereby, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have this movie in mind um, called Iron Sky w w that recounts uh, starts in I think somewhere in 2000s whereby the Nazis uh, after their defeat 
uh, just before actually they had created uh, spacecrafts that looked like UFOs and they used these to fly off to the moon and hide in the dark side of the moon where they continued yeah. the, their little Nazi civilization until they returned to conquer the rest of uh, the world and it was a comedy and it was a good film I like that film a lot uh, it was very funny um, but but whenever Giorgiani talks about it in in a very serious way, I have these images, and uh, he basically c claims. I I would like to ask him how um, figurative, how metaphorical he is with his beliefs. But he seems to believe in that this actually happened, and that uh, Nazi Germany had developed some technology that's even unimaginable for us today. And uh, they broke off when the Third Reich fell. They went somewhere deep under the Earth, Antarctica, the dark side of the moon, somewhere where they continued. Um, I, I, you know, it's part of a more general tendency that I've been... I've been seeing as of, I guess, as of the lockdowns and the harder they are, the people are going off in strange directions. Um, I don't know if that applies to Giorgiani or not. I would love to have them to discuss. But from Heide, talking about Heidegger, who's a very difficult philosopher, talking about UFOs. I don't know where, where he's going with this. What is your opinion on, on all this? Oh, if you want, I expand on this and come back to George and after on the breakaway civilization. Yeah. Well, first, UFOs are real. And there has been some sighting of Nordic men in spaceships, uh, perhaps representing a breakaway civilization or genetically improved humans abducted thousands of years ago. Yeah, I, or, yeah. I know I, I know that the philosopher that you mentioned before, Castrum, uh, what Kastrup. was it? Yeah, he, uh, and I actually read that book, he um, talked about UFO sighting as kind of proof of his theory, which has nothing to do with the breakaway civilization and has everything to do with every phenomenon being a mental phenomenon somehow, but, but perhaps you could explain better. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, maybe they are just hallucinations, these Nordic men. But UFOs are real. We know this because the Pentagon last year uh, made it. Uh, okay, we knew it already, but now we have proof. But as for the breakaway civilization, we have no proof of its existence. And even if it exists, by definition, we would have no means to control it, to overthrow it, or to even deal with it. Uh, it's great for a sci-fi movie, but being overly conspiracist is damaging, actually, to our cause. Uh, we already are too marginal to play with such conspiracies which add nothing uh, um, to our already very controversial cause. Uh, I don't say such civilization does not exist. I say it's not the most parsimonious explanation for UFOs. So uh, UFOs, well, the first option is a U.S. secret program. Uh, it uses the U.S. as uh, the UFOs use uh, the U.S. Air Force as an unwilling sparring partner, jamming their radar and evading them. Uh, should the Air Force fire at it, it will be even a better training for, to, for them. Now, usually military technology benefits uh, civil society within decades. But this time, it will be the first time in history where there is a radical decoupling between civili civilian and military technology. Now, if UFOs are US technology, it's very good news. It means that a war against China will be a piece of cake, as UFOs seem to have the ability to incapacitate even nuclear missiles. Uh, now, even during World War II, the US refrained from using their UFOs for attack missions. Uh, because uh, in the, the scenario I am speaking about, uh, the 1944 uh, Foo Fighters would have been U.S. Uh, crafts. Now, of course, option two, aliens. Uh, UFO sightings have started in 1944 uh, with Foo Fighters, and just months before the first nuclear test, as if it were the signal for becoming interesting to aliens, the first nuclear bomb. There is a third option, a U.S. alien program, of course, uh, which will leave some room for a breakaway civilization, but again, no proof. And then there is a last uh, option, interdimensional hypothesis. Uh, for it's, Actually, it's not Kastrup, uh, it's Jung, it's Jacques Vallée, and uh, Kastrup does not use this as a proof, but he says, yeah, maybe the Jungian approach is the good one. Uh, you know, when the collective unconscious is ready, the myth changes, 
and we see other paranormal beings. We move from seeing fairies to seeing UFOs, uh, which are the manifestation of the archetypes of uh, the collective unconscious. So to conclude, we don't know about the breakaway civilization and it does not really matter. Um, I would say that what matter is to create a breakaway civilization, a transhumanist civilization. Yeah, that, 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 that is another interesting option to explore. Like, how do you see this option of um, um, a, a modern breakaway civilization? Because uh, Giorgiani is an example, uh, actually, and he disqualified that as a fact, but he used it as an example. Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Which, which is a type of breakaway civilization whereby, um, you know, a very anti-socialist breakaway civilization, whereby in this novel, Ayn Rand's uh, a famous uh, Russian-American writer uh, who inspired the neo-liberals, uh, the libertarians very, very much. And uh, she wrote that book, Atlas Shrugged, which I have not read, but apparently there's a group of top you know, this engineer entrepreneur who was apparently her dream, you know, um, kind of like Elon Musk, perhaps, but uh, who they're tired of uh, our world and the, the socialism that is happening, that they don't want to be paying for lazy people. I think that's how Ayn, Ayn Rand would present it. So they break away and they go off to live. And as they leave, they kind of destroy their own uh, work because it's theirs and they can do it both morally and physically and uh, just to prove on how much of the world depends on these few geniuses so they 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 break it and they and, and they go somewhere else um uh, Giorgiani mentions this book as an example but he does not believe that this is exactly what happened just to be fair to every author um but could that be a possibility, you think? Someone being inspired by your work, by Giorgiani's work, perhaps a bit by my work, and saying, you know, there's no way to change things from within. There's no way to change things as they stand. Let's start over somewhere, somehow. Do you see that as a possibility? Well, yeah. Uh, I would say that there will be three possible branches for mankind. The first uh, are the simple humans, the anti-transhumanists for religious reasons, for instance, instance or moral reasons will choose to remain humans on Earth, for instance. The second branch will be uh, left-wing transhumanism, uh, and the other branch may be right-wing transhumanism. And of course, they won't stay on Earth, they will colonize the cosmos. Uh, maybe uh, I would place Elon Musk uh, in uh, an Ayn Rand, uh, right-wing uh, branch of transhumanism, saying we won't be able to do whatever we want on Earth. We have to, 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 to cut everything and uh, go into space and do our experiments here uh, on man. Uh, now about, uh, yeah, it's very possible, of course. Uh, now, Ayn Rand, uh, I would say that her model of society, I don't know her a lot, but I read a bit about her. Uh, it's a model which is far too rational. Uh, it's like uh, the humans in uh, 2001, the Space Odyssey, uh, they are very boring, very rational, but very boring, like a bunch of, of robots, human robots. Um, uh, like, yeah, between geeks and robots, and it's not my model of... Um, I don't put rationality above everything like Ayn Rand does. Uh, for me, it would kill life. And in 2001, the Space Odyssey, you you see that humans are no more living creatures. They have become just brains and rational brains and neocortex, uh, that's all. Mm -hmm. do, do you see someone like uh, Elon Musk? Do you see someone like Elon Musk as an example of a Promethean man? Or is there something lacking, you think? <laughs> uh, there is a lot lacking in Elon Musk, but we don't need in him what it what is lacking uh, because uh, Elon Musk embodies what precisely is lacking in the West today. Um, I mean, I will enlarge maybe uh, a bit the, the answer. Um, I would say that the West has already dominated the world. We have no will to revenge, nothing to prove. 
Uh, the strength of the non-Western civilizations like China is their sense of past humiliation and their desire for revenge, which maintains their cohesion and their will to power. Uh, now, the weakness of the West is that it is the only civilization to have dominated the world. Uh, the prospect of this domination no longer makes Westerners dream. And this psychological reality, um, coupled with the bad consciousness instilled by Christianity, undermines our will to power. Uh, in order to restore healthy will to power, uh, we will have to go through the painful phase of humiliation, of anti-white racism, of colonization. Uh, now, Elon Musk, Google, and all the transhumanist entrepreneurs um, they are the last, I would say, the last flame of the last Promethean flame. Uh, they are a bunch of geeks. It's sad, of course. A geek is someone very uh, lacking a lot, a lot. But the flame of Promethean flame of techno, uh, techno, uh, technophilia has found refuge in these geeks. Which, like a lot, they are not full human beings. They are very lame, I would say. Uh, when you hear Elon Musk, he's not Superman like some uh, right-wing man want him to be. Uh, he is very boring to listen. But yeah, it's where the Promethean flame found refuge. It's just like um, the the, the patri patriotic uh, will um, found refuge in um, shelter, I would say, in uh, Trump, which is not a Superman either. Um, so, they, these geeks, they surely show that Prometheism is not dead, but it's struggling against right-wing conservatism and is threatened to serve the agenda of the leftists. Because, you see, there is virtually no right-wing transhumanist. Almost all of them are left-wing, dreaming to create the Christian new man, mm -hmm. etc. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's a good, I like what you said, that it found refuge to these people. I do believe that as well. I do believe that ideas have a life of their own and they like, like, like wounded animals. Yes, they can find refuge to certain people who perhaps are not ideal in carrying them in their full magnitude, but they, they, they will do for now. Um, and, and you talked about transhumanism a lot and just drawing things to a close. My mind is very much on what's happening on the world. Um, it seems that COVID has expediated, has accelerated certain things that were already happening, but it, it has thrusted them more. It, one reason that I was always very skeptical of what's happening is that it seems that this seemingly random event just pushed the world towards the direction that it was going to. Anyway, we were going towards more, um, you know, atomism, social distancing, in a way we were already doing partially because of social media, um, b because our cities or big metropolitan cities in Europe uh, were uh, broken up either by poverty or mass migration or just the brutalism of modern architecture, our communities, um, fast, you know, applications from, from delivery apps to were there at a, at, a, at a moment's notice to bring us food where we're sitting, we didn't need to go out, social networks, Tinder, the like. We were going there already and it seems that covid just pushed this movement that was already happening it pushed it like 10 5 10 years to the future do you see some kind of plan there or is it all random yeah i will try not to overlap all the analysis you can find on youtube by the fact that the virus is an accelerator of already undergoing developments uh, such as the digitalization of the economy, which is not bad. Uh, actually, I would hate to have to live in a big city. Um, also, censorship against so-called fake news, and of course, the Cold War between the US and uh, China. Now, about the virus, uh, it's the third, third time, I think, a virus escape, escaped from a Chinese lab. Uh, they may have altered and improved it, but I don't believe they unleashed it on purpose on their own people. Makes no sense. Uh, now about China. Uh, around 2015, yeah, China abandoned the Tang Xiaoping's advice not to seem aggressive and be patient. You know, uh, hide your fire. You know, hide your smoke. Okay. But China grew even more aggressive since the virus. Uh, China made the mistake to behave uh, very aggressively at virtually all its borders, behaving just like it was a superpower already. 
in a hubristic way. Uh, but China is not a superpower. Even Japan alone can cut China's energy supply uh, for Beijing lacks a significant blue water navy. And uh, such aggressiveness tends the relations between China and its adversaries, which reinforce, you know, the Quad Alliance, which is very good news, actually. Um, now, about the new world order and a possible plan, well, I don't think there is a specific plan to increase social control. Uh, I think the state, just like any administration, seeks to increase its power. Uh, just like during the Black Plague, you know, the state increased its own power without a, a real plan, actually. It's kind of a plan, of course, there are, there are people behind it, but it's not like a, a real conspiracy uh, between mm -hmm. governments. Just, yeah, the way they are, the will, the will to power of the state to increase its power. I think the main culprits are Western societies at all, uh, which have become so fragile and fearful that they are willing to grant these powers to the state. Even if this virus is nothing like the Spanish flu, which must be called actually the Chinese flu because it came also from China. We know this uh, today, uh, even on a very, um, uh, and even Wikipedia, you know. Um, generally speaking, I don't separate the elites from the society as a whole. Uh, if mass immigration has been possible in the West, it's because the society as a whole has been complacent. Uh, it's the same for the Chinese virus. In France, there has been virtually no resistance against the three lockdowns. Uh, people are wearing the mask even, even alone in a park or in a forest. Actually, the Promethean and adventurous spirit of the West is virtually dead, and the state and the elites are not responsible. The responsibility is collective. We are a more and more fragile society asking for the state to become more and more maternal. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, there's definitely something that I see. And yeah, it, it's very interesting that um, not a long time ago, I read a book called The Bronze Age Mindset, uh, which was perhaps writ written for a younger audience than myself. But uh, it was, you know, pushing young men, I guess, and trying to inspire them. Uh, to become not Promethean in that transhumanist sense, but very Nietzsche and will to power kind of amoral to become pirates. You know, it was an exaltation of the pirate, the Viking, the warrior, um, the conqueror, the conquistador, regardless of how society is going to see it and how m morality might dictate otherwise. Just go out there, grab what is yours forcefully and take it, claim it, claim life, claim women, money, claim, you know, uh, through your will. And uh, it, it ended with this quote uh, by the author uh, who's called pseudonymously the Bronze Age pervert, great name, um, said these times, these times were the times of the conquistadors, says, these times will come again. And what came again? The lockdown. So it seemed to me at that very moment that for all the bravado of that, you know, radical right, uh, we can be locked in by the flick of a switch. Uh, we are very weak in the hands of forces that seem very strong for all our YouTube videos and books and um it sometimes feels ridiculous how 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 weak we are. Uh, do you feel something like that? Yeah, I'm very pessimistic. Actually, I'm quite desperate about our possibility to to win the game because you know the left is much smarter and vicious than we are. Much uh, the naivety is not. Uh, we all, we always say you know uh, say ah oh, left wing people are stupid people. You know they are naive. They are like we say bisounours, like uh, small bears uh, from uh, for ch children uh, animes in France. No, they are not. The naive are the right wing one because uh, you know. Um, um, all the intellectuals uh, having been able to control the institution, university are the left wing. Uh, real talent is not in the right, actually, because um, it, ha it has passed to the left, actually. We and and all this bravada, yeah, saying, oh, Trump, we won. No, it's very, very superficial. The deep state, uh, of course, it exists, and uh, it's uh, it's they are not Nazis. They are just left wing, uh, radical uh, uh, ideologues uh, controlling everything. So, ah. Uh, yeah, there has been some room for hope around 2015 and 16. It was but... exactly. 
these years were were strange because there was on all fronts uh trump was getting elected and uh I remember lots of YouTubers uh, that I would watch, like Stefan Molyneux, um, um, that I'd, I'd watch, you know, Joe Rogan was very, was kind of flirting with this idea. It's Jordan Peterson, I didn't, I, I did not like him as, um, as much as some people seem to do, but he was there. Um, Katie Hopkins was a, was another journalist english great humor very funny reporting on you know mass migration around europe um, and th there were all these youtubers uh, rebel media and then very quick like very quickly effortlessly it seemed they were silenced stefan molyneux got deplatformed katie Hobbs, you know just literally the flick of a button and yeah, you can go to other platforms, but let's be realistic about this. You know, uh, it's a monopoly. Social media are a monopoly and they can close you with impunity, with impunity, Ju just like they can imprison someone like J Julian Assange and pff, that no one will care. So, it, yeah, I, I, I personally don't see I'm, I'm trying to figure it out myself because it's not a theoretical project for me anymore. It's uh it's very imminent because this new world that's definitely rising around us is not very hospitable to me and, and my spirit. Uh, I'm not for this world, for this world that's rising, I mean, you know. Um, so I'm trying to figure it out myself. Where do you see like a, a ray of hope? First, uh, I would say that the only reason why there is no total, uh, that there won't be total censorship is because they need the fascists or so-called fascists as a scarecrow to justify uh, their ideology. They need us. So they keep us um, living, but they, of course they can crush us and uh, censor, censor us as, uh, as they want. Uh, if we don't cross the thinner and thinner uh, red line, a, a ray of hope Wow, I would say that it's okay. It's paradoxical, actually. Um, the left-wing ideology does not control all of the world. It does not control China, for instance. Uh, so they, the Promethean flame, may go to China. The problem is they will create a new man, which is not a Western new man. It's just like. Um, ants, you know, a collective, a collective entity, a, a super ants. Uh, so maybe we, 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 I, the, the good news is we cannot um, envision the future. It's much too complex. And maybe an external event, uh, maybe, from, of course, there is also Russia. Uh, and uh, Russia, maybe if there is a Russian revival um, and in Eastern Europe too, uh, which actually uh, I'm much more optimistic about Eastern Europe than Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the hope is that the West is much larger than only Canada, America and Western Europe. There is also Eastern Europe. There may be some migration of very talented people from uh, the US and uh, Western Europe to Eastern Europe and um, um, a brain drain, a reversed brain drain. Um, and maybe India, why not? Uh, they are not our geopolitical enemies, just like China. Maybe also Japan, you know, they are our allies. So there is an Australia, I don't know. Uh, of course, the left wing uh, presence is very strong here too. Uh, there is some room for hope in the biggest West. And by the way, I'm not against the European Union. I'm only against their ideology. And actually, I want something even larger than the European Union. I would like a pan-Western federation uh, from uh, Seattle to Vladivostok and integrating also Australia. I mean, uh, um, the, um, the, the bigger Europe, Europe of uh, wherever there are Europeans, it's Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what is the next project for uh, Roman? Oh, uh, actually, um, I'm not some someone who wants to remain in the same um, category. You know, I, I used to be very interested by geopolitics, and I I understood that uh, 
we don't need a better understanding on how to wage war, for instance, and military strategy, because the enemy is from within. It's an ideological battle. So I shifted my center of interest towards ideological ideologies and political science. And then I'm much more interested now by consciousness, philosophy of consciousness. But I would try to do some mix between um, political ideologies, um, an ontology of uh, yeah, an ontology and a cosmology. Uh, it's still uh, I'm less um, I, I, I'm not very um, I mean I want to relax a bit before writing a, a third book, but it will be kind of a mix between all these fields. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So I will wish you well with all these projects. Um, it's been very. Uh, enlightening to hear uh, things from your your side. We've touched upon a lot of dangerous ideas for sure. Um, but like I said before, uh, to hell with it. You know, um, we're, we're publishing either way. Um, Roman, I want to thank you for being here and sharing your views and your ideas and your work with us. It's been a pleasure. I thank you so much, Michael, for the invitation and also your very interesting comments. Yeah. Thank you. This was On Tyranny, and I wish you all a very Promethean future.